morning and welcome to the First Unitarian Church. Our service today is a tribute to one of the great poets of our lifetime, Mary Oliver. She was born on September 10th, 1935 in Maple Heights, Ohio. She began writing poetry at age 14 and at age 15 went to the National Music Center in Interlock in Michigan where she played an instrument that would shock most of us today who identify her as a poet with a gentle hand. Mary Oliver was in the percussion section of the National High School Orchestra. I have nothing against percussion, but Mary Oliver? I know, just, it's a hard one to reconcile. She attended Ohio State University and then transferred to Vassar College but never graduated. She never received a college degree. And so I consider her the, the Steve Jobs of poetry. <laughs> she said at one point, poets are born, not made in school. Well, she went on to receive the National Book Award in 1992 and the Pulitzer before that in 1984 and she published more than 20 volumes of poetry. As a young woman, Mary Oliver worked in Austerlitz, New York, alongside of Edna St. Vincent Millay's sister, Norma. They organized the late poet's papers. And during the same period of time, Mary Oliver met her life partner, the photographer Molly Malone Cook. Molly died in 2005. Mary and Molly made Provincetown their home where they lived and worked together for more than 40 years. Our tribute to Mary Oliver this morning will be minimally biographical and devoted mostly to recognizing her voice as a poet who captured a spirit in our hearts that was uniquely hers. Mary, Mary Oliver might well be best remembered for her singular engagement with the natural world, which she, she used both as metaphor and also as a teachable. She could be very direct, as she was in her essay called Upstream. Teach the children. We don't matter so much, but the children do. Show them daisies and the pale hepatica. Teach them the taste of sassafras and wintergreen, the lives of the blue sailors, mallow, sunburst, the moccasin flowers, and the frisky ones, inkberry, lamb's quarters, blueberries, and the aromatic ones, rosemary, oregano. Give them peppermint to put into their pockets as they go to school. Give them the fields and the woods and the possibility of the world salvaged from the lords of profit. Stand them in the stream, head them upstream, rejoice as they learn to love this green space they live in, its sticks and leaves, and then the silent, beautiful blossom. Attention is the beginning of devotion. Symbol of light and of knowledge. Symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. May we open our service by turning our hymn books, please, to number 21 for the beauty of the earth.
songs came to be. But before I do that, I just wanted to thank Tom himself for doing this service. And uh, for uh, Dave Zabriskie for introducing me to Logan, for Logan to sing it, and Zabriskie for keeping the whole uh, box behind in here on the whole process. <laughs> You're the first people to hear them, besides the ninth service. So, <clears throat> I regularly go into our, our local bookstore, King's English, uh, you know, straight to the poetry section, to look for new books by uh, Mary Oliver. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I found a new book on the shelf called Redbird. And Redbird is a reference to the eastern seaboard cardinal. We don't get to see them around here, but uh, they don't migrate. So when you see them against the snow, it makes an impression. So I open the book and I read the first poem. And it's the first poem in this song cycle. Uh, it's a lovely thing. I flip to the back, read the last poem. It's a good way to sort of measure a book. That poem is called Red Bird Explains Himself, the, the last poem of this song cycle. So I flip to the middle of the book, and I find a thing called I Will Try. And it's, that poem is clearly about the death of her partner a few years before. In fact, the whole book is, is, is uh, about that whole experience. So I've got the poems, but it, it's taken a little while to get them to the point where we can form them for you. So.
forgot to mention this. John forgot to mention this. This mic I don't think is on. Uh, there are lyrics in your, uh, in your program. I would prefer that you follow along with them as I'm still buried in this music. <laughs> Step from the house to see what I see and hear, and I will praise it. I did not come into this world to be called.
But this was only the first trick I had pulled off among my other mythologies. For I also knew obedience, bringing sticks to the nest, food to the young, kisses to my bride. But don't stop there. If I was the song that entered your heart, then I was the music of your heart that you wanted and Wilderness bloomed there with all its followers, gardeners, lovers, people who weep for the death of rivers. was my true task to be the music of the body the music of the body the music of the body Logan and John, thank you so much for adding a dimension to the poetry. And thank you, really, from the bottom of my heart. And um, Jared, thank you for your, your prelude this morning. I look forward to uh, the postlude later. 
So we go from the, uh, the song cycle, the red bird in your order of service, to announcements. <laughs> but of course, this is a church after all. We're, we're not at the Met. We're at the First Unitarian Church. I want to make these really, really brief. I just want to uh, ask you to just read the announcements and just, just mark uh, the stuff that is of interest to you, whether it be the artists discussing art or the dinners and dialogue, uh, the meditation group. Uh, there's, you're going to find something just suited for you in this uh, remarkable church community. Another aspect of this church community that I find uh, just, uh, again, remarkable is that our, our high school youth are engaged in, they, every year they have a mission um, in which they travel and learn so much. And this year, they're going to be traveling uh, to Montgomery, Alabama and Birmingham, Alabama on a civil rights learning, feeling, emotional venture. This costs big bucks and they are going to, the high school kids are going to uh, have a coffee house uh, on Friday, March 1st from 7 to 9 right here. And tickets are available now. Please stop by the religious education table. There will be some high school kids there uh, gladly happy to sell you some tickets. If for some reason you can't make March 1st because of a, another uh, engagement, they will accept donations, um, <laughs> which is brilliant because it never occurred to me. that uh, <laughs> yeah, You don't have to be there physically, but it certainly would be nice if you could. The offering will now gratefully be received, a chance to greet one another and bid each other a fine good morning. Mary Oliver never explained her remark when she told an interviewer several years ago, poetry saved my life. We can imagine, given the difficulty of her childhood, where she was sexually abused by her father and suffered neglect by both parents, that she sought and ultimately found that which would serve as a balm for her soul, that which would indeed save her. Poetry rescued her quite literally. In her book of selected essays published three years ago, she wrote, adults can change their circumstances, children cannot. Children are powerless, and in difficult situations, they are victims of every sorrow and mischance and rage around them. For children feel all of these things, but without any of the ability that adults have to change them. Whatever can take a child beyond such circumstances, therefore, is an alleviation and a blessing. Well, this comment comes about as close as I've ever found to what she may have meant by saying that poetry saved her life. If I were the interviewer, I would have responded that her poetry saved not only her life, but many lives, probably too many to count. And if Mary Oliver perceived poetry as a blessing, 
she has in turn blessed countless others. In trying to, to piece together the, the evidence of poetry as a salvific influence in her life, I'm reminded of her remarks about immersing herself in nature, where she could relax in it and actually take on the characteristics of trees and clouds. And this is what she learned. The world's otherness is antidote to confusion. That standing within this otherness, the beauty and mystery of the world, out in the fields, can redignify the worst stung heart. Now, after all that she was forced to endure, the need to redignify herself is palpable. She commented that when she was young, she was such a stranger to herself, she felt she hardly existed. She said she had to go out into the world, and by this she meant the natural world. I had to go out into the world and see it and hear it and react to it before I knew at all who I was, what I was, what I wanted to be. In her observations in and amidst nature, she admired the humility of the natural world and seemed almost embarrassed by what she called the, the vain glory of humans. When the fierce bear becomes sick, she wrote, he travels the mountainsides and the fields searching for certain grasses, flowers, leaves, and herbs that hold within themselves the power of healing. He eats he grows stronger. Could you, oh clever one, do this? Do, do you know anything about where you live, what it offers? Have you ever said, Sir Bear, teach me. I am a customer of death coming and would give you a pot of honey in my house on the western hills to know what you know. Mary Oliver wrote a fine line between confessing that every poem was a part of her life and her disdain for confessional poetry, which she characterized as catharsis, not art. It was a derivative of therapy. I believe the closest she ever came to, to anything confessional was in this poem. I go down to the shore in the morning, and depending on the hour, the waves are rolling in or moving out. And I say, oh, I am miserable. What shall, what should I do? And the sea says in its lovely voice, excuse me, I have work to do. Mary Oliver may well share her personal story, but she is far from ever being self-indulgent or needing catharsis. Although she wrote that every poem was a part of her life, she added, but it is also about your life and a hundred thousand lives to come. If that one person wrote it, is not nearly so important or so interesting as that it pertains to all. And when I read Mary Oliver, I have this uncanny sensation that yes, her poems pertain to me too. But how does she know? Or better yet, how did she find the words that speak of a truth I do not turn to nearly enough. Now, I've, been, I've been wrestling with poetry as a genre, not my favorite, 
for a long time. And I've been trying to discern from the moment I was introduced to Mary Oliver why her poetry carries a direct line to my soul. Now, poetry as such, regardless in which period of history it was written, poetry is by nature supposed to be a little enigmatic. It avoids the precision of an essay and the intricacies of a novel, and instead serves as a kind of puzzle that we need to figure out. Uh, because poetry is not always readily digestible, it requires a bit of interpretation on our part. And therefore, a poem actually needs us to include something of ourselves in how we come to understand the poem. And so a poem at its best is really, it's really a conversation between the poet putting emotions into words and our response to those words and emotions and images that the poem presents. Ultimately, we need to figure out just what the poet wants us to hear. Now, I'm not, I'm not always sure I am hearing what the poet intends. Some poems don't allow me to engage with them in conversation because the poet is too busy pontificating. The, the puzzle that the poem presents may be so confounding and way beyond my literary capacity that I, I simply don't engage. And truthfully, I don't care to engage. The poet Frank O'Hara once said, if you don't need poetry, well, bully for you. <laughs> and there are quite a number of poems, especially those published in The New Yorker, when I think, I don't need this, bully for me. But I need the poetry of Mary Oliver because we have this conversation going. She speaks to me, and probably to you too. In what voice does she speak? This is, this is interesting because she seems to defy any classification. Now we, can, we can say Mary Oliver is a feminist poet, and she, after all, reiterated in, in several of her essays that she did not give to anyone the responsibility for her life. It's mine, she says. I made it, and I can do what I want to with it, live it, give it back someday without bitterness to the wild and weedy doom. But does this qualify as feminist? And we are all responsible for our lives, and it's up to us to live it fully. Assuming responsibility for our own life is less of a political platform as it is posing a, a universal challenge, or is it simply a reminder to own our own lives and for heaven's sakes take responsibility for it? Because nobody can do that for us. And when she famously asks, what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? She speaks as a master teacher. Now, we know that life is precious to the point where life is precious resembles a cliche. But when she asks, what are you going to do with it? It becomes more urgent. A, a wild life cannot be put on hold. And by the way, what does she mean by wild? Well, that's, that's part of the conversation between her and me. Now we can say Mary Oliver is a naturalist. Her poetry often observes nature, much like Emerson and Thoreau. 
But those old transcendentalists did mostly an accounting of nature, listing what they saw in precise ways. But Mary Oliver opens us to the, the subtle wonders of nature as she observes the wide-winged herons, the curious muskrats, the sugar-eating grasshoppers, the laboring ants, the delicate and slow opening of a single pine cone, a sunrise welcoming the marshland, the white faces of stars shimmering on a frigid winter evening. And Mary Oliver gives us new eyes with which to observe the life that escapes our awareness because of our preoccupation with, well, with stupid things, quite frankly. And thus, when she speaks as an environmentalist, that's altogether so much more powerful than a factual checklist of how human arrogance destroys the lives of other species deemed not so important as the human species. Here's, here's her poem called Lead. Here is a story to break your heart. Are you willing? This winter, balloons came to our harbor and died one by one of nothing we could see. A friend told me of one on the shore that lifted its head and opened the elegant beak and cried out in the long, sweet savoring of its life, which, if you have heard it, you know is a sacred thing, and for which, if you have not heard it, you had better hurry to where they still sing. And believe me, tell no one just where that is. The next morning, this loon, speckled and iridescent, and with a plan to fly home to some hidden lake, was dead on the shore. I tell you this to break your heart by which I mean only that it break open and never closes again to the rest of the world. Does Mary Oliver speak in the voice of a Zen master? Well, she does kind of have that certain quality, but then she always ends up in the voice of Mary Oliver. Her poem on meditating, sort of, makes this clear. <laughs> Meditation, so I've heard, is best accomplished if you entertain a certain strict posture. Frankly, I prefer just to lounge under a tree, so why should I think I could ever be successful? Some days I fall asleep or land in, in that even better place, half asleep where the world, spring, summer, autumn, winter, flies through my mind in its hearty ascent and its uncompromising descent. So I just lie like that while distance and time reveal their true attitudes. They never heard of me and never will or ever need to. Of course, I, I wake up finally thinking how wonderful to be who I am, made out of earth and water, my own thoughts, my own fingerprints, and that glorious temporary stuff. Sometimes Mary Oliver speaks on behalf of all artists as though she, she were their representative and an ambassador to the non-artist world so we can understand artists a whole lot better. She offers a, a clear message on how we need people of all sorts, including professionals, so vital in helping the world go round. And we don't want
want them to depart from their objectives. For example, when you're on board a plane flying 35,000 feet up, you want the pilot to be his regular and ordinary self. You don't want the pilot to try anything fancy or new. <laughs> Just do what you know how to do. Fly, fly the airplane. Don't drift into some interesting thoughts. <laughs> you, want, you want the flight to be ordinary, not extraordinary. And you have the same line of thinking when it comes to your surgeon. The ambulance driver, the captain of a ship, let all of them work, she says, as ordinarily as they do, in confident familiarity with whatever works and no more. Their ordinariness makes the world go round. Now, we all live in this ordinary world. We like feeling comfortable in it. But the artist, in stark contrast, is not trying to help the world go round, but forward. Now you might say that the artist is out of love with the ordinary. Artists have a different outlook, a different set of priorities. The artist is in another world altogether. The extraordinary is what art is about. And this is nothing an artist can control or regulate. It's the machinery of creativity itself. Now, let's be clear, Mary Oliver does not belittle the work that makes the world go round. Good, good heavens, she, she depends on the pilot and the surgeon, etc. We all do, and bless them for their sure-handedness. But the artist is concerned with the edge and the making of a form out of the formlessness that is beyond the edge. So whether our life paths engage in the ordinary that makes the world go round or in the extraordinary that aims to move the world forward, well, both are essential. But what kind of work falls into which group? What kind of work then is extraordinary? And she answers that. She says, intellectual work, sometimes. Spiritual work, certainly. Artistic work, always. Now making this distinction that the role of the artist is to move the world forward helps me understand my own way of evaluating artists, poets, musicians, sculptors, writers, choreographers. That is, I resonate with those artists who impact my life by creating from beyond the edge and thereby move my world forward. Some do. Some don't. Mary Oliver was a feminist, naturalist, environmentalist, poet, teacher who moved my world forward. We were always in conversation. You know, her, her diagnosis of lung cancer in 2012 never stopped the conversation. Death left his calling card, she said. Hmm. I understand. Mary Oliver moved us forward while she herself was dying. In her poem, The Fourth Sign of the Zodiac, she offers a little puzzle for us to, to solve easily enough. The fourth sign in the Zodiac is cancer. And so this poem is actually in four parts, but I'm only going to refer to, to two of them. She begins, why should I be surprised? Hunters walk the forest without a sound. 
the hunter strapped to his rifle, the fox on his feet of silk, the serpent on his empire of muscles, all move in a stillness, hungry, careful, intent. Just as the cancer entered the forest of my body without a sound. Oh, I know you never intended to be in this world, but you're in it all the same. So why not get started immediately? I mean, belonging to it. You, you could live a hundred years. It's happened or not. I'm speaking from the fortunate platform of many years, none of which I think I ever wasted. Do you need a prod? Do you need a little darkness to get you going? Let me be urgent as a knife, then, and remind you of Keats, so single of purpose and thinking for a while, he had a lifetime. There's another little puzzle for us to solve. Why Keats? probably because he lived only 26 years. He thought he had a lifetime. Mary Oliver had the voice of what I always thought a minister's voice should be. Wake up. Do you need a prod? Do you need to be visited by darkness before you feel the urgency of living each day fully. Mary Oliver died three weeks ago. We will be in conversation for the rest of my life.
Jared, thanks. Thanks so very, very much. Uh, let us break for uh, coffee, uh, conversation, and maybe sharing some of our own recollections of Mary Oliver's poems.